Welcome to this series of lectures on uh, CAFRAC in which there will be a set of lectures which will go through different topics which include classification of cataract, then you have acquired cataract, congenital cataract and management of cataract. There will be opportunity to take assessment for these lectures at a different website which we will share the link. Classification of cataract is pretty simple that we start off with definition of the cataract. So cataract is any opacity in the lens or its capsule whether it's congenital or acquired. And uh, if we see the anatomy of the lens where we see that it starts off with an embryonic nucleus and then you've got a fetal nucleus then infantile nucleus and then you've got your adult nucleus and outside you've got the cortex. Equator is the most important part of the lens. Here is the area which is the factory of making new lens fibers. So lens fibers start from the periphery and keep going in the center. So it's just like the bark of a tree in which you have them. And what happens here the lens epithelium transforms into elongated lens fibers and they change to form the different parts of the lens. So if you look at the anatomy of the lens, it's a biconvex, so it's convex anteriorly and posteriorly and is attached to the ciliary processes by zonular fibers which help to refract and focus light on the retina. It is non-vascular which is very important because it has to be colorless and, and transparent. The refractive index is important to note that it is 1.336. The lens fibers are stiff, elongated, tightly packed in the prismatic cells. And they are divided as we showed in the previous slide in the central core which is the nucleus and on top of that you've got the cortex and then on the, uh, on the outside you've got a capsule. The whole lens is, the capsule is actually elastic which allows for the lens to actually become thinner or it can become thicker in size. So this is very important to note that it can change its shape. So here you can see the lens looks a bit thicker in this picture. So lens capsule is thin, it's transparent collagen membrane and it surrounds the lens completely. It's elastic in nature but contains not any elastic tissue. It is anteriorly secreted by the lens epithelium and posteriorly by the basal cells of the elongated epithelium. So here is the anterior part and here is the posterior part. This PSC what we see over here, this is called the posterior subcapsular cataract which you see typically in front of the posterior capsule. This posterior capsule is very important in cataract surgery because this is the place where you put the intraocular lens in place after doing your surgery. And if there is a rent in this, that is called a posterior capsular rupture or posterior capsular rent and through that vitreous can prolapse forward and if there is not enough posterior capsule you can actually you are unable to implant a IUL in the bag. You can either implant in the sulcus or if it's not possible you have to implant into the uh, into the anterior chamber or either you need to do a scleral fixation of the IUL. Then we go on to the anterior lens epithelium. It's single layer below the lens capsule and it's formed of cuboidal cells and becomes columnar at the equatorial region which is important to note that they change shape into the cuboidal and then in the center they become into lens fibers which are cells elongated to form fibers and which have got a complicated structural forms. Mature lens fibers are cells which have lost their nuclei. As the lens fibers are formed throughout the life these are arranged compactly as nucleus and cortex of the lens. So lens transparency is transparent due to the arrangement of fibers, internal structure and the biochemistry of the lens and fibers as we've explained. So the incidence of lens opacities in normal population with age, you can see it's not very uh, prevalent at the age of 65 but after age of 80 it's 100%. So as time grows older it the cataract becomes more. It does not mean that 100% every patient will need cataract surgery because with age the cataract might be nucleosclerotic and the patient might be visually 
having acceptable vision so you might not need to have surgery at that moment so it all depends when we go into the assessment of cataract before surgery we'll discuss in that area so what does actually the cataract do it produces it causes the visual acuity to get blurred so you're getting blurring of vision due to scattering of light on the retina and here you can see there's normal vision, then you've got a vision through an early cataract, and this is a very advanced cataract which you're seeing. So this is how you see light. And the other thing which is important in a cataract, is this is a normal seeing eye, and this is a patient with cataract through which you can see scattering, back scattering, or you see there's glare. The patient says, I see streaks of light around the lights which I'm driving and I it's typically the posterior subcapsular cataract which produces this type of problem. So the lens is made mostly of water and protein fibers and the opacity may occur when the lens proteins clump together. Ability for the lens to refract light reduce which cause reduced visual acuity. Chemical modification on the lens cause it to thicken and harden. So with age what is happening is your lens becomes hard because all the fibers are compact. We'll, we'll go through this when we go into the acquired cataract. So before we go uh, any, into further details, it's better off to just briefly go through the pathophysiology of why. Why do we get the formation of cataracts? Not fully understood, but if we take the three metabolic pathways which control glucose into ATP uh, energy and rele relevant molecules, so it's from there, we can extrapolate with what is happening uh, in the development of cataract. So one is the glycolysis, the other is the pentose phosphate shunt, and the third is the polyol root. So normally, you've got your glycolysis root for which cells get their energy. So with aging, there's decrease in hexokinase concentration, drop in ADP level, and there's poor control of electrolyte balance, massive influx of water into the lens, disorganization of structured proteins in the lens, aggregation and precipitation of protein leading to the formation of cataract. So this is just an idea giving you how glycolysis can cause this. The second pathway which we go through is the hexose monophosphate pathway. It's a shunt for glycolysis and it's the only cytoplasmic pathway that generates NADPH. It is essential for cells lacking mitochondria for generation of NADPH. And this is not very important in the cataract development. The third one is the most important one, especially in patients with diabetics. Normally, cells use glucose for energy. Any glucose not used for energy will enter into the sorbitol pathway. When blood glucose is normal, aldose reductase has a low affinity for glucose at normal concentrations. While in hyperglycemic state, the affinity of aldose reductase for glucose arises. This causes much sorbitol to accumulate and this change of affinity is called activation of the polyol pathway. Here we see you've got high glucose level in the blood. The polyol pathway is activated and the glucose is converted to sorbitol by the aldose reductase. So people are actually doing research on aldose reductase inhibitors to reduce the damage done by the sorbitol in diabetics. So accumulation of sorbitol in the lens leads to a hyperosmotic effect. There's efflux of excess water through aquaporin channels and formation of cataract. So sorbitol collection in the lens can affect cells and naturally occurring proteins. The lens becomes less clear and less opaque and more opaque and this eventually leads to formation of cataract. So now come to the topic about the classification. So if we classify broadly, there are certain classifications, there are different classifications which we can use, but we'll start off with the simpler ones, which is the etiological classification. The first in this is the congenital cataract, which can be familial due to intrauterine infections, maternal drug ingestions, elderly with age, that is senile cataract, which you see typically. With metabolic, you see diabetes, hypocalcemia, Wilson disease, and galactosemia. Then we come on to drug-induced cataract, which include corticosteroids, myotics, amiodarone, phenothiazines, and then you have 
traumatic and inflammatory cataract after post-intraocular surgery and uveitis is an important cause for that. Then we have other diseases associated such as Down syndrome, dystrophia myotonica, Low syndrome and atopic dermatitis. So there's one type of classification depending on what is actually the cause of cataract which we are seeing. Then it can be actually due to the shape or the type of morphology of the cataract which you're seeing. And one is number one is posterior subcapsular cataract. Then you've got the nuclear cataract, then you've got cortical cataract, and number four is the polar cataract. We'll go through each of them as we go forward. Here you can see the anterior polar cataract is at the level of the capsule, and it can be either anteriorly or it can be posteriorly. Similarly, you can have a cortical cataract, which can be of different types, which we'll go through later on. Then we have a nuclear cataract, which is the other predominant type. And the third is the posterior subcapsular. So the three most important are one is nucleus sclerosis, second is cortical cataract, and third is posterior subcapsular. And the fourth, as you remember, is the polar cataract. So those are the different morphological cataracts. And these are actually what we are looking for when we are doing the examination, because the different strategies when you're trying to do surgery, phaco emulsification, the different uh, methodologies which you can use to handle different type of cataracts, and there's certain type of complications which are associated with different type of cataracts. So these, that's why it's important to know the anatomy. So we've already gone to the four parts. There's one, another one, if we just see the coronary cataracts, type of a cortical cataract. So the cortical cataracts can be categorized into different shapes, which we'll go and see as we go. So there, here, this gives you another picture in which we are able to see some more uh, cataracts, which we did not see earlier. So when we go through the nucleus, you can see the nucleus is being formed by the layers secreting one, then another compacting. So it's only one layer is opacified the the layer ben beneath and inside is clear and the layer outside is clear that is called a lamellar nuclear cataract then you've got a cataract in the cortex which is above the nucleus that is called a supranuclear cataract and the third which you see another one is the the cortical cataract, the blue one, but the most important one which we wanted to show is this Y thing which you see. The Y is straight in the front and it is upside down at the back. So that is called a sutural cataract. And then these dotted lines are the posterior subcapsular cataract. Those were just on illustrations. Now if you want to see them clinically, how they will look, you can see a cataract on torch examination if you're an undergraduate student, but if you're postgraduate, you need to see it on a slit lamp and to identify the different types of cataracts which you're seeing. So normally the lens is clear, then you've got this immature cataract. Here you see the color looks a bit green. Then you've got mature cataract. It tends to have more yellowish tinge into center. Then it tends to shrink the cortex and the nucleus. It's called hypermature cataract. It can actually be of two types. Hypermature are usually they swell and after swelling they become the shrink because in this picture it, it is showing that shrinkage type. Then you've got your nuclear cataract and then the posterior subcapsular. The important thing is the posterior subcapsular might be very little but it causes significant visual loss for the patient and that is what we are assessing before surgery. People might be having 6-9 vision and they would like to have cataract surgery because they have a posterior subcapsular cataract. Patients might be having a plus three nuclear sclerosis. They might have six, nine vision, but they say, oh, we don't want surgery. We are pretty doing pretty well. So classification based on the degree of maturity. In morphology, you can change it into the degree of maturity as well. So mature cataract is one in which the lens is completely opaque. Then you've got the immature cataract was one in which the lens is partially opaque. This especially is an important question in undergraduate. Is it a mature cataract or an immature cataract? Which we'll show you as an illustration what we mean and how we can see with a torchlight clinically. Obviously on a slit lamp, it's much easier to tell. 
Hypermature cataract is shrunken and wrinkle anterior capsule due to leakage of water out of the lens. While Morgagnian cataract is a hypermature cataract in which liquefaction of the cortex has allowed the nucleus to sink inferiorly. Immature cataract, there is a pacifications become more diffuse and irregular. The iris shadow is still visible. The lens is not completely opaque. Wedge shape opacities and the periphery of the lens and it progresses gradually. So immature cataract, there was an era before like 30 or 40 years ago, people would say, has the cataract ripened? We're going to have surgery after the cataract has ripened. Or in our local dialect, we'll say, motia pakya hai. And white cataract or cataract is actually called safad motia in our lingo. While glaucoma, which is a disease which we covered before, that is called kala motia. So we've got to differentiate between a cataract and a glaucoma in the local lingo as well. Because people are going to be talking in the outpatient department telling you that this is what I've got, so you need to identify which thing you have at that time. Taking the history. So then there are types of immature cataract. Can be nucleus sclerosis due to increased thickness and hardness of the nucleus accompanied by brownio bruniosis. Pigments may be formed by the action of light on tyrosine containing pro proteins. So that leads to when the nucleus sclerosis advances with time, the pigments lead to their change initially that becomes yellow and then it is brown, which is called a brunous cataract. And at the final stage, it is called a nigrite, changes into dark brown that looks like a nigra cataract. So cortical spoke opacities are the other type of cataracts which are immature. There's loss of transparency in a group. So there might be just some fibers which are opacified. You might see them as spokes accompanied by disruption of the cell body. And opacities are typically shaped like a wedge. So if you see they'll they be a, like a wedge and they might be in the periphery. And usually in the earlier stages, they do not have a significant role in decreased vision. Then you have the iris shadow in immature cataract. When there is a clear cortex, and when there is any clear cortex between the iris and the opacity, grayish white in immature and senile cataract, the shadow of the iris which show, falls on the opacity is lysed, is caused upon the eyes visible through the clear cortex, which we'll see in the next slide. This is called the iris shadow as a common sign of immature senile cataract. Here you can see if we look at this picture, the light is shining. You bring the light from the side and the light shines on the iris and it casts a shadow on the lens as well. Here you can see, if you look at this, this is no iris shadow because the lens is totally opaque and the iris is pretty near to the surface of the lens. So there's no uh, opacity, no shadow over here. While in this patient, the nucleus is present, but the nucleus is not going up to the capsule. So there's a space between the capsule and the nucleus. That's why when the light falls on the iris, it is going to cast a shadow of the iris in the space between the nucleus and the capsule. So this is where you see this black crescent, which you see that is the iris shadow. And typically you'll be asked to see if it's a mature or an immature cataract. So immature cataract, if you want to sort of point out the differences, the visual acuity is reduced to counting finger in immature, while the visual acuity is reduced to hand movement or light perception in mature cataract. So the immature cataract might have vision, which might be 6.9, might be 6.12 or 6.18. Typically, with extracapsular cataract days, the vision which you use for treatment was 618. Somebody's got vision equity of 618 will advise cataract surgery. But with invent of phacoemulsification, we can do surgery at 612 vision as well. And in some places, depending on the requirement of the patient, you can actually do it at 6.9 as well. The lens is partially opaque and the lens is totally opaque in a mature cataract, which you showed earlier. The iris shadow is present in immature, while there is no shadow in a mature cataract. And the fundus 
may be visible in immature but it is definitely not visible in a mature cataract and it's very important that you do B scan fundus examination on these patients before you go in for cataract surgery so you do not have a surprise maybe the patient has got retinal detachment before cataract surgery and you didn't know but the patient is not going to be happy when he finds out that you removed the cataract but the vision remained the same because you did not tell him that he was a retinal detachment which will need further surgery. So this is a picture of a cortical cataract. So you can see these are typically spokes of a cortical opacity. This is a sutural cataract which you see in the center. So the Y in the front and this is an inverted la Y at the back. A sutural cataract usually does not have any significant effect on visual acuity. This is nucleosclerosis. Central, you see, this is more brownish or yellowish appearance. This is the capsule, anterior capsule, and this is the epinucleus of the lens, then part of the nucleus which is surrounding the denser compacted fibers. And on the slit lamp, this is the, the, this is the slit beam through the cornea. So, in nucleosclerosis cataract, on the opposite side, patients tend to get more of a myopic shift because the fibers are more compacted. So the rays of light which are passing through, they will be able to converge closer to the retina or closer or in front of the retina because they have increased refractive index. So they can improve the patients having hypermetropia. They, get, they say, we got a second sight. We don't need any glasses now. It's, it's God-given sight. It used to be a common misconception before, and it is because of patients having nucleosclerosis, they tend to feel that. Then we got on to posterior subcapsular lens opacities, which is due to the formation of defective lens fibers at the equator. It's due to secondary, co secondary causes predominate, such as toxins, steroids, and light. Posterior migration of lens fibers result in accumulation of the posterior pole. Here you can see typically a posterior subcapsular cataract. You can see whole of the lens is clear. And here you can see there's no nucleosclerosis, but there's just some fibers present which are opaque in the posterior subcapsular area. And in certain diseases that becomes more common, especially in steroid patients who are taking steroids, they tend to develop opacities in the posterior subcapsular areas. Patients who are high myopic, they tend to have a longer size eye, so they say that might have a reduced nutrition near the posterior subcapsular area, so they tend to get those type of opacities. Vaculations of water clefts, which are changes seen in cortical cataracts. They radially dispose optically clear vesicles in the suture line. The earliest defect is separation of lens fiber ends within the suture. Then we come on to lamellar cataract, which we described earlier. It's an embryonal nucleus is clear, but the surrounding, it is an arcuate rider which envelops the nucleus to a greater or lesser extent. So it's, it's sort of a circular or spherical shaped opacity, which has clear lens outside and clear lens matter inside. So that is called an lamellar cataract. So maybe patients went into some stress, the body went into some stress at an embryological stage and the lens fibers were not properly developed so they remained opaque and then after that everything became okay. So then they started secreting clear fibers so that's why they tend to get and that area of the lamella which got opaque that embedded uh, into the clear fibers later on. Then we've got this entity which is called the blue dot opacities. These congenital opacities are rounded white or blue opacities. It is thought that the color derives from di diffraction effects. Blue light is more easily scattered than longer waves lengths. They do not affect visual acuity but sig significantly unless very severe but there may be a loss of contrast sensitivity. So these are small whitish initially when you're a resident, you think, oh, this, he's got so many spots. How can he see through them? <clears throat> but actually, when you look at that, you find that they do not have a very significant visual loss. Then in diabetics, you can get snowflake type of opacities. They're osmotic overhydration. The, develop, the cataract develops quickly. And initially, it appears that a posterior subcapsular opacity, but over a matter of days, the opacity becomes very dense. Here we see 
a white mature cataract. It's a very opaque white cataract. Only the anterior lens cortex can be seen on the slit lamps. You cannot see a nucleus in this. The lens fibers become disorganized and the cell membrane fails so the cells swell up. In tumors in the lens can precipitate narrow angle because the lens fiber as they grow, the lens is slowly growing, growing and becoming thicker. And as it becomes white, it tends to imbibe water and becomes more thicker and the iris will overlap or push behind the iris and lead to relative pupillary block in these patients. Then we've got the hypermature cataract characterized by wrinkling of the capsule to the liquefied lens cortex and Morgagnian cataract with sinking of lens nucleus inferiorly within the capsule. So there are two types. One is Morgagnian is different from a hypermature. So we'll make the nucleus sink down. This causes inflammation, eye pain and headache because of complicated glaucoma. Hypermature cataract is rare and needs removal. Here you can see the wrinkling on the surface of the capsule, anterior capsule, and it is typically a mature cataract. So that's why it's called a hypermature cataract. While a Morgagnian cataract, complete cortex is liquefied and appears milky white in color. The nucleus settles at the bottom and usually the nucleus is brown or it's usually a brunescent cataract. Calcium deposit may be seen on the lens capsule. Here you can see this is typically a Morgagnian cataract, the brownish area, and this is the area of the cortex in which you've got this uh, calcium deposits as well. And here you can see the reason this is a normally a mature cataract, but when it becomes intumescent means that it becomes thicker or it imbibes water and it becomes thicker. That is an intumescent cataract. And this you can see the, the distance between the slit of the cornea and the slit of the anterior capsule. The distance becomes less and when there's intumescence and that is the area here. You can see actually the distance of the slit at the periphery at the angle becomes narrow and this patient goes into an angle closure glaucoma. Then you can get other types of cataract which we'll go in detail later, especially in patients who have uveitis. The posterior surface of the iris gets stuck to the lens and that produces opacities or the anterior polar or anterior subcapsular cataract because lens is a vascular, avascular structure. So if the iris comes in over here, which is a vascular structure and it, which gives nutrition to that lens epithelium from that area, that can produce those opacities which are called the anterior subcapsular or anterior polar cataract. Some patients have got zonules which are lax and cause this lens, whole lens, which is cataractus, has prolapsed into the anterior chamber. So that is a patient with anterior subluxation. While this is an older patient who had trauma and he had got this whole of the lens, the zonules actually broke up with sudden shaking of the zonules and that produced subluxation into the anterior chamber. Obviously, when the lens goes into the anterior chamber and it comes in contact with the lens endothelium, it is going to produce decompensation of the cornea, which is very important. You never need the endothelium to decompensate because it is not going to regenerate. So that is one thing which we protect. Even during surgery, we put viscoelastic so that to protect the uh, endothelium. Then there are congenital cataracts, which can be polar cataract, central cataract, which form within the first three months. You can get a complete nuclear cataract, zonular cataract with riders form within the first 12 months, punctate cataracts or blue dot, which is also called cataractra cerulea. Or you can get cataract morphologies determined by the stage of embryologically at what stage the body goes into stress and that is going to decide which type of cataract do you get? So in the end, this is just showing you a posterior polar cataract. This is a type of cataract in which the opacity develops congenitally. And where the opacity develops, there's actually a defect in the posterior capsule as well. So this is a special cataract which you need to identify. The important thing you will see in these cataract is you can see this very sharply demarcated opacity. While if it's a posterior subcapsular, you might see an irregularity of the area. And if you look carefully, you might see this blackish line. You might see a defect in the posterior 
capsule in these patients. So this is very important to identify. So for, for today, we are going to end our discussion on classification of cataracts. This gives you an idea that cataract can be either classified with a shape or it can be with a cause or the degree of immaturity. And when you're assessing a cataract, you need to know to define why did this cataract happen? Sometime in diabetics, you might see an early cataract and that might be the only sign in patients who's 30 years old that he's a diabetic. So sometimes you pick it up and you ask, get your blood sugar done and you pick it up at that stage. Some patient might be hypocalcemia. Patient with different syndromes, they develop, they uh, tend to get different type of cataracts as well. And with that, we'll finish of this session and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you very much for watching. Please subscribe to the channel and you'll get the latest update on any new lecture which is uploaded. Thank you.